Nice to meet you guys. This is my first collective intelligence. I appreciate the chance to come talk with you all. Most of my work is actually about surveillance and privacy, which I think actually has a collective intelligence dimension, but um, I thought I'd take advantage of the opportunity to meet everyone here to talk about uh, a project that I'm recently, that I'm on the tail end of finishing, just finished writing up a manuscript about, um, which has to do with users' biases. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the problem that you know the so-called sharing economy, gig economy, platform economy, um, has a lot of feature, like one of the beautiful things about it, right, is its capacity to connect people to one another for services, for rides, for home share, for, you know, other types of platforms too, like dating platforms, crowdfunding platforms, all kinds of platforms that have this, like, great capacity to connect people. But one of the other kind of, like, really inherent features of these platforms is that when people tend to connect on them, they behave t to one another, they treat one another in sometimes undesirable ways, right? And so a lot of this, um, like one, of, one really prominent example, right, had to do with Airbnb. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the study that was done that showed that um, black users on Airbnb who were seeking homes were much more likely to be told that the home, the places they were interested in renting were unavailable, like they could show this statistically, like that this actually, you know, was like a quite significant disparate impact um, and, you know, one way of looking at this from the platform perspective is like, well, this is just what users do. Like, we're just the, plat like, we're just the neutral platform. Um, but that has proved not to be a really satisfactory policy response, right? And you see this as a feature of lots and lots of different types of exchange. Um, and part of why I think this happens, well, let me say this first. So I was really interested in this dynamic. And with my colleague, Solon Brokus, who's also at Cornell um, in information science, we started thinking about the response to the Airbnb debacle, which was basically that they like did this big report and they came up with a bunch of um, kind of plans going forward to try and mitigate these user biases. And we realized that actually this feature arises in lots and lots of platform-based contexts. And so what we decided to do was try and systematically assess how is it that user biases play out online when people exchange with one another in some way, and what design strategies are available to platforms that either mitigate bias in some way or might exacerbate it. And you can imagine that this is important for a lot of reasons, right? Depending on the type of platform, different platforms like afford people lots and lots of opportunities for jobs, for funding, for homes, for romantic connection, right? And so our survey, we looked at 50 platforms with the help of some really talented graduate students, and we looked at all those different styles of platforms, right, to just get a sense of like what are the, what are kind of the design options. And the reason we thought this was important is first that you can't not design. Right? There's no, there is no neutral option. Everything you do, like every piece of information you choose to display about your users, every decision you make about how you match users with one another, or if you don't, those are all choices. So platforms basically have no choice but to kind of like, medi like to mediate these interactions. Um, and second, because, you know, like offline, in offline exchange, like say dating, right? If you meet somebody offline, there are lots and lots of indicia of who, it's not that you necessarily treat them fairly, right, or without bias, but there are lots of indicators, right, there's like a pretty thick exchange, and online exchanges tend to be somewhat thinner. So people tend to depend on the pieces of information that are available to them in deciding, you know, who to buy something from or who to, you know, swipe right on or whatever. So what we ended up doing was creating a taxonomy of 10 kind of big buckets of design strategies. If anybody's interested in this work, I'm happy to send you, the paper is in draft right now, it's going to a law journal, the Berkeley Technology Law Journal, um, but I'm happy to send you what we have actually, we'd love to get feedback on it. And we tried to just sort of categorize, like what are these strategies that people use? And we didn't test them, right? It's not an empirical test of how effective are these, but it's kind of a roadmap that could be used going forward of like what are the options that are available. So I'll just tell you, I'm not gonna tell you about all 10, but I'll tell you about a couple, just so you have a sense for the types of things I'm thinking about. Um, so with the Airbnb controversy, for example, one thing that gets highlighted a lot is like, well, maybe if you don't show people photographs of one another, you remove a piece of information on which they could make a biased decision, right? Like showing, it's like arguably unnecessary, right, to like show somebody the face of the person who's going to rent your place, like who cares, or at the very least you could maybe show it later in the process, like after the exchange has been like fully, after the transaction is more fully realized, that can be a problem too because people cancel. Um, but that's often something that people talk about is like withholding information, similar to like, uh, this is kind of a trope at this point, but the idea that like symphony orchestras do these blind auditions, right, and that that has ultimately been really good for women's inclusion 
right? Lots of, lots of strategies depend on withholding information or sharing more information, like trying to establish somebody as kind of a whole person, like knowing what kind of music your Uber driver likes, that stuff like that, right? Like people sometimes do that as kind of a way to try and get people to focus on like your exchange partner as a whole person. That's, these are not unproblematic strategies. Actually, we know from some other contexts that limiting the amount of information people have on which to make decisions doesn't necessarily make them stop making decisions on that basis, but just causes them to default to other indicators. The clearest example of this is the ban the box strategy, right, where we stop, many municipalities and companies stop asking people if they have a criminal history on the, I, like, on the justified idea that if employers ask that up front, they, that those people will have worse chances of being hired. But actually, like a lot of really interesting recent economic research shows that if you do that, minor, racial minorities have subsequently worse outcomes because people just default to the assumption that people of a different race are more likely to have criminal backgrounds. So you have to be really careful when you do this, right? You can't just like do it willy-nilly. Another really common example is ratings, right? Ratings-based systems. We have, I have another paper about this that's specifically about ratings. Um, if you allow users to rate one another, which is super common on these platforms, right? Like, it's very, very, very likely that the ratings people get are likely to be inflected by people's inherent biases about race and gender and those types of things. It's very hard to tease those out and like identify, we talk a little bit about ways that companies might try to identify when um, ratings are inflected by bias. But this also enables like could potentially systematic mistreatment of different groups of people. Um, another one is just like what sorts of tools you allow on your site like to search and filter. So on dating websites, for example, should you include a racial filter, right? Like you can imagine if we did that on Facebook, like I only want to see, you know, my Latino friends, like that would strike us as really weird, but actually that's a very common feature of a lot of dating websites, right? So all of these things and then a bunch of other stuff that I won't talk with you about are the sort of features that we looked at. Now the relevance of this work, I think, to this community is that though the mechanisms may differ in non-peer-to-peer -peer contexts, I think the questions and the, the import of design doesn't differ. Right? So if you have a participatory process or a participatory website, the design of that, pro and your users are interacting with one another at all, you have to assume that the design of that process is potentially going to mitigate how users perceive one another, what they know about one another, how they're matched together for various activities, et cetera. And that means that the group that you identify as a public might itself be like a very kind of skewed version of the public. Right? And we know this for some other reasons, but I think this is a different kind of conduit for bias to enter into some of those decision, some of those decision processes. Um, so that's what we've been working on. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited to, to talk with the rest of the panel and I'm also happy to share the work if anyone is interested. Thanks. Okay, next we have Eric Gordon from Emerson College, the engagement lab there. Is this on? Yeah. All right, great. Hello, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Eric Gordon. I'm gonna sit down, I think, just to keep it different. Uh, <laughs> just keep it a little Aaron, spicy. the pressure is on you, what you're gonna do that's yeah. still different. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be nice. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Eric Gordon. I'm a professor of civic media at, at Emerson College, and I direct a lab there called the Engagement Lab. And uh, what we do with the Engagement Lab is the, uh, we're focused on the application of art and design uh, to civic life. So we're trying to understand uh, ways in which uh, creativity and play uh, can impact the civic fabric. Um, and that we work both uh, domestically and, and abroad in, in different contexts with youth and adults. And I, I won't go into the, into the detail of that work, but I guess for, for this group, also it's my first time here at Collective Intelligence and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, but I also am here, uh, I, you know, I'm maybe the only humanist in the room. And, and I think it's, a, it's, it's interesting to, um, uh, it's, it's, it's great to have that opportunity to, uh, to, to, speak, to, to speak to you, um, to add that, uh, that kind of humanist perspective. And here's what I, I guess where I want to go with that. Um, my work has been on this idea of, of um, trying to understand the values driving civic media work. Uh, and I it came to this work in my, in my initial academic interest in looking at the intersection of, of cities and technology, um, trying to understand the ways in which technological innovations were changing the shape and the experience that people had of cities. Um, 
Then I began, as I, as I started doing that work, I, I started to realize that, you know what, that in fact the experience of cities had a lot to do with this civic context, how people actually under, made decisions together, how people connected to one another, the role that uh, difference and inequity had uh, in, the, in the fabric of the city. So technologies, uh, for me, in my early work, uh, was uh, I was looking at it more, uh, I guess, more from a, a top-down view. And as I started exploring this more, it, it, it occurred to me that, in fact, uh, everything that we say and think about, about cities um, and, and media and technology have to do with that, um, that very embodied uh, experience uh, that comes from that. Um, and so in civic media, the, so the way that I define civic media, and I published a book last year called Civic Media, um, and in that book, uh, my, my co-author and I, we, we, um, we described it this way. We said civic media are the technologies, designs, and practices that produce and reproduce the sense of being in the world with others toward common good. And we use this phrase common good very intentionally uh, because what, what occurred to us and when we looked at this broad range of media and technology practices where people were, uh, where the intention was some sort of civic impact, what was connecting people together was this sense of they were using the media to connect with other people toward some good. Now, and that's not good with a capital G or common with a capital C, but it was a sense of, of, of collective good. And that could be the, just the people on the stage, and we were working together and we're using media to, to accomplish that. Uh, but the, what was interesting about it is that, that this is values-driven practice. And so this, this changed the way that, that I started thinking about, um, about the role of technology, because what was happening at the time, and this was several years ago, is that civic tech was associated with innovation and was associated with novelty. And the dialogue was largely about uh, technological novelty. It was largely about um, what can we do to create novel technologies that would increase the efficiency of civic life in some way or another. But actually what, what, what we were seeing was that in fact what was happening by the practitioners, um, both within government and, and outside, what was happening is that they were in fact thinking about that in terms of, thinking about the technology in terms of novelty, but they were actually thinking about the technology as something that allowed them to achieve a commonly held sense of good. Uh, and, and trying to understand the nuance of that practice was what's, what is what has been driving my work for, for many years. So there's one thing that I, I, I want to, and I, I guess I won't talk about any specific projects, but happy to do that in, in conversation. But one of the things I will talk about is a, is a book project I'm working on right now that tries to address some of these concerns with a framework that I just want to briefly describe to you. Um, so as, um, as, as technology was driving towards a particular value faster and more intensely than any other value, um, and that value was, uh, is efficiency. Uh, and what was happening, and I was hearing this from government practitioners as well, saying, yeah, we want this technology because it's going to make our jobs easier, it's going to make things happen faster, and it's going to be cost-saving. Um, and, and for those reasons, we want to employ this novel technology to, to allow us to do our work. Well, that's great for some things. It's great for service delivery. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great for things that are primarily transactional, like paying taxes or parking tickets. That's wonderful stuff. Um, where it becomes problematic is when it, when it enters into the realm of, of, of democracy and deliberation. When it enters into the realm of the emergent qualities of governance and, 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 uh, and, and being in the public. And so what occurred to me is that what, one of the things that is driving this work from the practitioners, from the people who are actually doing it, was this sense of value, that we were, we were working together to achieve some common good. We're not necessarily working together to achieve efficiency, and yet that was the narrative that was being, um, that was being perpetuated through a number of the circles that I was, that I was operating within. And so here's where I've, I've, I've come. Now, um, I've been working in this space um, for a long time, and uh, I, started, I started designing games for, uh, for, for this space. And when I was doing that, I was, you know, often that, you know, the word gamification would, would always come up. It's like, great, you're going you're gonna to put badges and points uh, onto things that people don't want to do, and it's, you're, you're going to make people do things more efficiently. I'm like, no, no, that's not what I wanted to do. And it was really disturbing me in the work that I was doing that, that the framework of games was actually commandeered 
uh, by the champions of efficiency within governance, uh, and it was and gamification became a way of of prodding people to to uh, to do things um, more efficiently. So here's how I started thinking about it, and and now where I, I don't I'm not that interested in making games anymore, although I still do. Um, I'm actually interested in what games can teach us, and this is and and here's here's what I'll say. So. The philosopher Bernard Suits uh, wrote a book called The Grasshopper, which is probably the best book ever written about games. Um, and in this, in this book, he, um, he describes a game, and I'm gonna paraphrase, but he describes a game as, by definition, an inefficient system. And what he means by that is he says that um, when, you play, when, when you play a game, you, you typically, all, he uses the example of golf, and I'll use that too. So um, when you play a game of golf, um, the, the, the goal of, of golf, let's say a particular hole in golf, is to get that little hole or a little ball into that little hole that's really far away. The most efficient means of doing that would be to pick up that little ball, walk over to the little hole and drop it in. But we don't do that when we play a game of golf. In fact, what happens when we play a game of golf is that we put all these unnecessary obstacles in our way um, like a big stick and a tree and a sand trap and water and all these things. And we do that on purpose so that we can play the game. And so one of the things that Bernard Suit says is that these systems are inefficient because they allow us to play. And that's in fact the point of any game, is, is that it allows us to play. So what, what's inspired me about that idea is what, what, what I'm now calling meaningful inefficiencies. Now, um, now and, and what I want to achieve within this civic space is the design of meaningful inefficiencies into systems. Now, games can be, games have to have goals, they have to have clear feedback, they have to have all these things that allow for a, a good experience in that game. But if they don't have those inefficiencies built into them, then we don't get to play. And if we don't get to play, then there's no emergent meaning that, that, that um, crops up. If we don't get to play, then we don't discover things that we didn't know about that system prior to entering into that system. And so when we are guided purely by values of efficiency, we exclude any possibilities of play and generative meaning making from our systems. And that's precisely what democracy doesn't need. Uh, and, what, and, and so when we think about designing for democracy, uh, and this is the last thing I'll say, I think we need to think about how do we design meaningful inefficiencies into those systems so that meaning making is not um, a thing of the past. Thank you. Okay, last but not least is Aaron Simpson from Civic Hall Labs. Are you gonna do something different? <laughs> okay, great. Great. Um, I was worried about following a talk as coherent as Eric's, but now I'm just going to write it all off as meaningful inefficiencies. <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks for the growth. <laughs> um, my name is Erin Simpson. Uh, I'm the director of programs at Civic Hall Labs, and we are a nonprofit that builds open source technology pilots for the public good and helps others do the same here in New York City. Um, and it's interesting, that is interesting in part because we are an intermediary organization and we emerged out of a collective. Um, we emerged out of a collective that was really good at thin collaboration in the civic innovation space and less good at thick collaboration in the civic innovation space. And so if you know of Ethan Zuckerman's work in civic engagement, I think it's great, but he describes thin and thick civic engagement. So thin looks more like clicktivism, and thick looks more like you know, really meaningful uh, work in your community or like really meaningful um, campaigns and policy change, substantive engagement. Um, and that essay is in a great book called Civic Media. That essay is in an amazing book <laughs> called Civic Media by the gentleman next to me. Um, so uh, Civic Hall Labs, the story actually begins almost 15 years ago um, when people from the um, Sunlight Foundation communities, um, the Nation Magazine communities, and the Howard Dean campaign were all really hyped up about what technology, the rise of the internet, and the emergence of mobile phones were going to do for democracy. 
Um, and so the Personal Democracy Forum Conference was started in 2004 um, to work on that. And so over the 10 years after that first conference, they had a conference every year in New York City. And then they started having them all over the world. And the conference grew um, to engage thousands and thousands of people every year. Um, a lot of really significant organizations and digital media organizations and civic tech organizations emerged out of this conference. And on the 10 year anniversary, um, they turned to that community of people who had been to the conference and they asked them, they're like, this has changed so much and we're 10 years in. What do you, what do you want us to do? And so our co-founders, founders of the Personal Democracy Forum, Andrew Roche and Mika Sifri, also the founders of Civic Hall Labs, um, listened to that community of people and they said, look, we're working in a really siloed space in a bunch of different ways. The problems we're working with are interdisciplinary, um, but the silos we're coming from are not. And so there's a couple of them that are really prominent. And those are partisan silos, um, but they're also disciplinary silos. So technologists and non-technologists is a really big one that we have to deal with, or government and activists, or issue areas that are interrelated, but instead broken up into people thinking about environment or health. Um, and PDF, the conference, was a space where you could come together and meet people in this neutral third space, um, apart from all of that who are interested in collaborating. And so um, it was really good at Think Collaboration. And the community came back and said, we want more of that. We wish we could have this conference all year round. I genuinely wish that I could meet the kinds of people I meet here and work together with them all the time. And so they founded a community center called Civic Hall, which is both a physical space and an online community in New York City. Um, it's a membership organization, and we have more than 1,000 members, um, including the federal innovation teams, a variety of New York City government agencies, major tech companies, startups, journalists, students. It's a real mix, and it's a third space. Um, and you can bet that the power dynamic is really important there. That neutral space is important, especially when you're dealing with government um, or when you're dealing just with polarized political situations um, where you need somewhere else to meet. Um, and so Civic Hall it has taken the let a thousand flowers bloom approach to collaboration, right? They're providing a platform for others, other actors in the space who are interested in how technology can further their civic work, be that in or outside government. They can come together and you should, you should meet one another. You can bump into each other over coffee, you can go to many events, you can co-work and finally say hello to someone after you've been walking by them in the bathroom for a year, whatever. Um, but the thing that we weren't seeing enough of was the thick collaboration. Um, and that's because there are a lot of high barriers to entry in doing so. And so Civic Hall Labs was founded as a nonprofit component to Civic Hall that would help steward that collaboration. And so um, we often act as a pilot partner um, to public interest organizations in the discovery, design, um, and development of whatever digital feature they're working on. But really, we're acting as an intermediary between the organizations that has the civic expertise that we're working with and citizens they should be working with, users, if you will, that they should be listening to, um, or technologists who they simply don't know how to engage otherwise. Um, and so we're solving for those significant structural barriers to inter-organizational or extra-organizational collaboration in the civic innovation space. Um, and a couple of things that we think about a lot um, that make it hard. So I already mentioned how cross-sector it is. Our problems are multidisciplinary. Um, it's not helpful to separate them out all the time. Um, but it's also a problem-based space, so a lot of organizations who have never done anything in the digital realm before um, will step into that with the idea of like, I, have, I want an app for this, or like, I want to build a website for that, and that's going to be great. Um, and a lot of our work is walking them back to thinking about why are you doing that, what is the root of that problem. Um, and you're moving organizations from a place of certainty, we know we want this to uncertainty. We're now acknowledging that we don't 
know what the solution is. We're acknowledging what the problem is. And we really encourage user-centered design. And so there's also a power transfer from hierarchies of power, getting to decide you know, what gets developed, um, handing over power to users and trying to give real power to the people, say, that a government agency is trying to serve and what their priorities are. And so that's just to say this is an environment of high uncertainty. And, na and helping organizations who are used to a lot of structure and a lot of certainty navigate all of that uncertainty in the innovation space is something we think about a lot. Um, and then the translation and the power analysis, and those are things that I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with. Um, yeah, and so I have um, a bunch of examples, but maybe those will come up in comments. Um, but I suppose the last thing I'll say is you know, I mean, civic media versus civic technology um, versus a bunch of other terms that you might call um, related practices that are actually very old, but uh, people who are trying to be innovative in whatever field they are, are trying to figure out what technology means to them in the government, civic, or activism spaces. Um, uh, Jeff Mulgan opened this conference by talking about um, how important it was to have institutions to steward the collective memory of a field or it would be lost. And I will just say that, you know, having the, ha talking about civic tech as a community has its downsides, but one of the upsides is giving folks an identity and connection points to understand and relate to one another and connect work that has commonalities but might be happening in very different spaces. And so we also just think a lot about the importance of creating um, norms and culture and spaces for people to come together both offline and online, um, just as touch points that ultimately help people um, step into that collaboration better, which is essential for the kinds of partnerships that will lead to collective intelligence later on and help break down the silos that are really, really prevalent in the space we work in. Um, those are some assorted observations for you. Great. Okay, so I want to start with some follow-up questions for each of our panelists. Let me start with Kate. Kate, you gave us a bunch of examples of fake news and false information and things intended to confuse, et cetera. Um, and you gave us uh, some examples on the screen, I believe, of things that we all know are false. Uh, but the question I want to ask is suggested by your shrug there. So how do you know what's true? How do you know that some of those things that you called fake news are not true? That's a really, it's actually a really, really diff difficult question. And um, I can say that after spending, you know, several weeks where that's all I did was go into those spaces, it became harder and harder to distinguish between um, what's real and what's not real and what's true and what's not true. And many of these things, um, well, there are, you know, these events happened, something happened, there's, there, you know, because I'm studying this in the crisis context, these, these events happen, there are, you know, there's a certain evidence to support them, but it's very hard to disprove the alternative narratives. Um, uh, there's, you know, that's why theories about 9-11 being an inside job, you know, are still, are, are still happening, and um, it, it is difficult. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that some of these things are so persistent, is it's, all, it's, it's very difficult to, to disprove them. Um, and especially from what I can tell, so this is, this is probably a little bit speculative, but these things are happening so far away from us, right? Historically, things happened, you know, in your environment. You might have known someone, you might have known someone who, who had firsthand or you had firsthand experience. But these things are happening far away. Um, and so where it might be difficult for you to say that the sh shooting down the street didn't happen, you might entertain that the, the shooting at, at Sandy Hook didn't happen, um, and people show evidence that these are actors or, or whatever, and it, it can be very hard to, um, to come up with a shared reality. And that was, that's what I think was so disturbing for me at the time, is that to see that people's realities are not shared, and that, and that we have these very different, different views about what's real um, makes, a, makes it hard to think about a cohesive society. Okay, so it sounds like you don't have at least an easy answer to the question about how to know what's real. Uh, 
Let's leave that as a question on the table. Maybe in our discussion with the audience, somebody out there knows the answer. Uh, so let's ponder that for a moment. And let me move now to Karen. Uh, Karen, you gave us some examples of how the interactions that people, communities have in the online world can often exhibit biases that people have before they entered the online world. And that some of the things that we might do to try to reduce the effect of those biases might actually, if not increase them, at least just let them pop up in some other way. Uh, so I think you raised some very interesting examples of problems or issues. The question I want to ask you is, what do you think we should do? Should we kind of outlaw biases completely? And if so, how would we do that? Should we allow some biases and not others? Kind of, what do you think is the right thing to do? I mean, it's such a, con that's a, it's a great question. It's such a context-dependent question. There are contexts where, like for example, with housing, right, or with employment, where there are like strong legal norms, not even norms, there are laws and norms that would suggest that minimizing bias to the greatest extent possible is incumbent upon us. And if we find that these tools kind of allow us to like backdoor bias into things like employment decisions where it would be illegal for a company to do those things on its own, but if it relies on say customer source ratings to, to do that, like if Uber drivers, if you assume that Uber drivers are employees, for example, which we don't know that, if they get fired because they get lower ratings, but those ratings come from customers as opposed to from the company themselves, if they had come from the company, like there would be a cause of action there potentially under employment law, right? But if they come from users who we know are biased as well, potentially there is no cause of action, but it's to the same effect. So there are contexts in which I think it's clear that something should be done and the thing that can be done, I mean, often it takes multiple strategies. So Airbnb, for example, I talked about earlier, in response to their report, they put together something like 20 different strategies. And it's who knows, right? Like, it's hard to say which will work in any particular case. One of the most important things that we suggest in the paper companies can do is measure empirically, like what, you know, do this in like a really systematic way where they, you know, they actually measure like what the impact of different interventions are. But I, to your point, there are other cases in which I think we actually don't want to intervene on people's biased behavior. So for example, with a dating platform, to suggest that users should be not racist in their dating preferences is a tough question, actually. Like there are real socioeconomic harms that result for different groups of people as a result of assortative mating, right? And like historic harm, like lots, there are definitely harms that occur, but to suggest that we ought to nudge people to change their intimate preferences is like a pretty like ethically charged question and has not always worked out well in the past, right? So it's context dependent both in terms of like design questions and in terms of I think the domain in which you're, you're making these decisions. So you're being a very good and careful academic here <laughs> and I'm trying to press you a little bit harder yeah, to yeah. express a personal opinion. Let's take I think the example of, can we call it interracial dating? Let's take that as an example. What do you think should be done? Should it be illegal to buy it to be? <laughs> I didn't think that's where we were going with this question. <laughs> no, no should, it, should it be illegal for a site to let right. you express a racial preference? Yeah, so, I, so actually I'm working on a project with a student about ex precisely this question right now, right? And we're looking at race and at uh, HIV status and ways in which different sites, particularly sites uh, oriented towards sexual minorities, try to either indicate what people's race, like some, sometimes like they're very heavily racialized marketplaces, right? And people like use them because they're looking for a particular sexual experience with a person of a particular race. And so, you know, some sites have done precisely what you, what you suggest and like they take that off, like they make a normative decision that they're not gonna do that. What sites do with HIV status I think is really interesting. It's difficult to ask somebody like to list their HIV status on a dating website or to ask them even to list a preference for HIV positive or negative people. So they use alternative structures rather than asking precisely, like one site we looked at called Daddy Hunt it has a pledge called the Live Stigma Free Pledge. And we talk about this in our paper. And what they do is you don't ever reveal, like they never ask you flat out, like do you have HIV or not? Are you HIV positive? But instead they ask you like, do you commit to treating people with respect regardless of their status, right? And like they provide information, actually resources on the site that kind of normalize um, different types of preventative treatment like that allow 
HIV positive people to have sexual relationships without infecting other people. Um, and those are design strategies too, but they're like kind of a softer touch, right? There's a lot that mm -hmm. companies, can, the platforms can do like with messaging, for example, on the site, advertising even that tell, that like spread norms, spread social norms about what types of interactions. I'm not ask, answering your question. You'll notice. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's because like, I mean, I don't run one of these platforms and I think like, because these contexts are so different, like that context is so different from Airbnb or a crowdfunding site or something. Um, like it just depends on kind of what the norms are, I think within that community. Okay, so you successfully evaded, evaded again. Yeah. expressing a real personal opinion. Yeah. I'll let you get away with it. I would, I mean, I would just jump on though and say that that is a much better question like for the companies um, whom we should be holding accountable um, for their influence, right? And, and we, you know, are, are pretty vocal about our activism around, so the call is very vocal about its activism around um, trying to hold companies accountable for their influence, um, be it in the election or um, be it with uh, whatever, um, like employment law or like housing discrimination or discrimination in dating. And, and I mean, we have had like interesting like digital physical interaction moments where Airbnb during the time when uh, the New York State Legislature was having some debate about it and Airbnb had um, subway ads up all over the subway in New York City. Um, and Airbnb said that it was gonna share some of its data um, to New Yorkers to prove that that was going to be great, and what and that so all of Airbnb's press releases are like we're sharing our data, and then at Civic Hall, it turns out Airbnb had booked a conference room, and that what they had was a laptop with the data set on the laptop <laughs> scrubbed, and you could come and you could try to analyze it in their CSV, but you couldn't export it and you couldn't take photos, and you couldn't bring your own devices in there. And so that was incredibly disingenuous, and it happened on our property, right? Um, and so like, that, was a, that was a really interesting moment of that. And, you know, again, the, like, the story they're telling. Um, or for example, with Facebook. So Facebook presented at the Personal Democracy Forum conference last week, um, and they shared um, some of the product that they had done around the election. And so their GOTV efforts were really incredible. They released a go vote product to every person on Facebook in the United States. Um, and that reach is really incredible. But also they let you favorite who you were going to vote for and share it with your friends, which would then become a data point as a part of the package for users of Facebook. And so the, the Facebook presenters wouldn't answer the question, does that data point become part of the package that's getting sold to companies? Um, and they wouldn't answer that question. And so privately they said, no, of course not, we would never do that. Um, Facebook is so nice and you're like, ugh. Um, and especially in these times, um, you know, thinking about the opportunities for boards of directors or other companies to become influenced by, say, nefarious politicians, um, like, that's really scary. So anyways, like, hard question for you, totally fair question to uh, companies who are responsible for those choices. And what do you think the companies should answer? <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to answer either. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, Eric, let me ask you a question. So I think you made a very interesting and compelling case for the benefits of inefficiency. You used a very nice example of the analogy of a golf game. It wouldn't be any fun at all if you were just efficiently putting the ball in the hole. The fun, the playfulness, the learning, a bunch of good things come from the inefficiency. Uh, what I want to ask you for is some more specific examples in the domain we're talking about. So golf is a great analogy, but what's an example of civic inefficiencies that would actually be good rather than bad? Deliberation. Say more. Give us some more detailed example Let's of it. Let's talk about that, shall we? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, d deliberation is, a, is a, you know, the, the process um, through which citizens deliberate about policy and or uh, issues that impact them uh, is an inefficient process. Uh, any kind of citizen engagement process is actually quite inefficient. And if you try to make it too efficient, what happens is that you kind of push people towards outcomes uh, when in fact the that, that part of the outcome is the process. So let's just take any example, uh, an example of um, one of the one of the outcomes that often happens from a good public engagement process is, is trust. And, um, and, and trust 
you know, building that trust uh, and, and um, opening up the possibilities for the relationships that actually are the cornerstone of some of that trust between institutions and, and the public, uh, that, that all gets messed up when, when, it's, uh, when efficiency is the primary value of the design. So, uh, and and so, th so I would say, you know, and so for me, um, the, anything that intersects with deliberative democracy um, is, is often run, runs counter to the primary value of efficiency. So I want to push on that for just a minute, but first in, let me do it in the context, of, or let's do it in the context of a specific example, if you can. So can you think of an example of a deliberation process that led to greater trust? Uh, sure. So I'll talk about a project I did, um, and I mean, I, there's there's a number of, uh, but I can I can give you more information about a project of mine. So, uh, and this actually involves a game that that I designed. So the game the, is that me? Let's, let's make a noise. I don't think it's you. Okay. Um, there is a uh, we designed a game called uh, called At Stake, and it's a it's a role playing game uh, where it's a mobile game, but it's played it's tethered mobile devices. It's played in small groups, but it can be, you know, big, big groups of people can form lots of small groups in, in physical space. Um, we, we use this in a participatory budgeting process here in New York City, uh, and we tested it out um, against a, uh, a uh, we, there was another game that, was, that we used in a control group that was a trivia game. It was like an icebreaker game. And, we, and, and then on, on the other hand, we used our, our deliberation game, both of which took about an hour to play. Um, the idea in both, the, both of those cases was the, uh, what we were hoping for in, in the deliberation game was, um, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me explain. What happens in that game is that you take on a character uh, and a role, and you advocate for, a, well, you, you propose a solution to a problem that is actually confronting that, that community, that, um, that group. You pose a solution to the problem, and then each table has a decider at the table, and the decider has to pick the, the uh, solution that they think is, is the best, and it's all, all timed. But the, the catch is that every person has an agenda, um, and it's a secret agenda, so you can't share that with others. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your idea picked by the, picked by the decider, but you're also trying to get your agenda items in other people's ideas. And the, and the whole point of the game is to sort of model the, um, the process of deliberation um, and also build empathy to other perspectives within that process. And so what we did by, uh, by entering into the, by inserting this into the beginning of a participatory budgeting process, which already is a kind of uh, high engagement, you know, kind of process, um, but, but people came in um, and we provided a kind of training wheel for deliberation within that game. And we also opened up the perspectives to all these different stakeholders in the community. And at the end of that game, what we learned from the, from the players was that they, had, um, they were much more likely to have learned something from somebody else in the community, not from a planner. Um, they were much more likely to understand the, they self-reported, but understand the perspective of other people in the community that was a, a, a perspective different than their own. And so, and they, and we also saw sort of incremental pushes towards uh, towards increased trust, uh, increased trust in not not in the in the government or not even in the system, but in each other. So, uh, one of the things that 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 did by by creating that inefficiency within the system, um, that that deliberation that wasn't directly tied to the outcomes of the process. Uh, what it did was it actually built a foundation that was ba based on empathy and increased trust in each other and other players. Uh, and see if you would agree with this. If you define efficiency not as how fast can we make a decision, but how fast can we build trust and empathy and shared understanding, could it be that they were still being efficient just on a different criterion? Sure. I mean, if we actually came up with a, with, if we were actually measuring how fast we could build trust, then yes, then, then, I, then they, are, they are being efficient. Okay. And so, and, and I would say that the term, you know, the, the reason why I'm embracing the concept of inefficiencies is, is a bit rhetorical, right? Like it's, it is a bit, uh, I am trying to intervene in a discourse of, of efficiency on purpose. And so if we came up with a, with a use of efficiency that was more aligned with the way that democracy works, then I would be all about Great. that. Great, okay, good. So I wanna now ask my last follow-up question uh, to Aaron. Uh, before we go to questions from the audience, so be thinking of your questions. 
So, Aaron, you gave us a, a very interesting teaser right at the very end of what you said. You said, well, there's lots of examples, but maybe we can talk about those later. So let me ask you to pick one example, one example that illustrates kind of some of the points you were making in your opening statement. Um, okay, sure. Uh, uh, this year, Civic Hall Labs ran the New York City Big Apps competition, which perhaps unfathomably is described as the uh, largest civic innovation competition in the nation. Um, it's in its seventh year, um, and it, it is a competition for new people in New York City to make apps um, on challenges that are put forth by the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And perhaps the goal is to create civic innovation, and perhaps the goal is to promote citizen engagement, and perhaps the goal is business development, or it's a combination of those things. Um, and so, I mean, we really embraced the uh, civic engagement um, and civic innovation aspect of this work. And so we completely redesigned the competition this year. And just to give you a sense of scale, um, Big Apps has a reach online of 20